ending slavery, child sex slavery, is, is somewhat daunting, but uh, it's able. An athlete with a mission. A lot of times when those children are rescued out of situations, they unfortunately don't have a place to go. Detroit Tigers pitcher Matthew Boyd and his wife share about their new initiative to help traffic girls. We will provide them with beds, three healthy meals a day, all the girls' physical, educational, spiritual needs. What's done is done. The past, it's gone. They have a family. Plus, my pillows. Mike Lindell shares how he went from a crack addict to creating the world's most comfortable pillow on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. Families around the world are getting back into the swing of things as school is back in session. One family is going viral after a photo of them praying before their first day of school was posted on Facebook. Jamisha Harris posted the picture with her three kids, ages 10, 8, and 7, praying in a circle before they went off to school with a prayer to God saying, Dear God, this morning I'm feeling nervous and a little unsure, but thankful. I pray for my children on their first day of school. God, I give them to you, and I ask that this school year you would use every person and every experience and every lesson to shape them into your image, to grow in them the fruit of your spirit. Well, thousands of parents reacted to the picture and shared it, saying it resonated in the wake of all of the recent tragedies. Jasmina says she and her husband pray every day with their children before school and hopes that the picture will bring peace to parents, teachers, and students and inspire them to pray. She says they may have taken praying out of school, but not God out of the children, and amen to that. Amen. And we all have the right to pray, and we can pray anywhere we want, including in school. Uh, it's, it's just our right to practice our religion. It's part of freedom of religion. But you know, also, if your house is like mine, in the morning when kids are getting off to school and you're getting ready, it's always kind of hectic, but this kind of breathes like a moment of, let's all rest in the Lord and get on the bus. <laughs> But, it, you know, what a great way to get over anxiety, yes, too. This I is agree. for all of us, whether yep. you have kids going to school or not. Lord, I give it over to you. Yep. And when you do that, yeah. I agree. Peace comes. Well, speaking of pictures, another photo is going viral of two eight-year-old boys from Wichita, Kansas. The photo is capturing the hearts of strangers all around the world with the two little boys teaching a lesson in kindness. Mom, Courtney Coco Moore, posted the photo of her son Christian on Facebook saying, I'm so proud of my son. He's seen a kid balled up into a corner crying, so he went to console him, grabbed his hand, and walked him inside of the school. It's an honor to raise such a loving, compassionate child. He's a kid with a big heart. The first day of school started off right. What her son Christian didn't know is that that other little boy, Connor, is autistic and was overwhelmed with everything going on around him. Connor says, he found me and held my hand and I got happy tears. <laughs> the two now have a special friendship with an inseparable bond. And Way to go, that. Christian. Yeah, that is a really. wonderful thing. Way to go, mom, too, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> You're doing something right. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Precious picture. Well, back to school means lots of first day of school pictures, and one Ohio mom takes the cake in the creativity department. Every year, Leslie Brooks of Columbus, Ohio, takes pictures with her three kids to commemorate the beginning of the school year. This year, she donned a unicorn headband, a rainbow tutu, and acted like she was dragging her kids, 14-year-old Leia, 13-year-old Carolyn, and 9-year-old Drew, out of the house. Leslie says the pictures are all in good fun and says it has actually become a creative, fun family tradition dating back to 2013. The kids were a lot younger back then and would get embarrassed, but now it's become a tradition. They all look forward to it. Leslie gets inspiration from her kids and they help create the theme and the props. As you can see, the family has had some fun creating these pictures and Leslie hopes one day they'll look back and get a good laugh at all the memories the pictures bring. Well, that's really the yeah. purpose of the pictures, yes, isn't it? it is. <laughs> yeah, way to go, Leslie, very creative. Yeah. <laughs> Most parents communicate with their children via cell phones, be it with calls or text messaging. And like many parents, Nick Herbert, a dad in the United Kingdom has a hard time when his son Ben doesn't respond back to him. So he decided he had enough and created an app called Respond ASAP. 
What it does, it locks his son's phone until he replies, either with a call or text. I am loving this. There are <laughs> other apps that tell you when a message is delivered and seen, but the message can still be ignored. With Respond ASAP, the app allows the parents to send or schedule a message, and the message will display on their children's phone over whatever else they're doing, blocking the phone until the child replies. <laughs> the phone will ring even if they have it set to silent mode. It even gives the sender the recipient's location. Parents can also receive ASAP messages from their children. Nick says he made sure his son knew that the Respond ASAP app is only used for important things and not just for everyday chat. The app is currently only for Android phones, but is coming soon for other devices like iOS and others. So what do you think? Is this? I think it's amazing. <laughs> I just <laughs> want to say thank you. Thank you. We're not even there yet with our, we have a granddaughter that lives with us. She's not old enough to have a phone, but we are already talking about the peril of such an event. <laughs> so this kind of breaks down some of that anxiety too. It's, it's really the, the, you can hear the parent's voice, call me or else <laughs> should be the name of the app. <laughs> what do you think? Um, uh, I don't know. I, I trust my kids, but yeah, well, they're, 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 all, they're all in their 20s. So, okay, yeah. if, if you're not responding, you got something else going on. I got it. But they're, um, I mean, 20s, you're, uh, I consider that you're yeah. a grown-up by then. doesn't mean you don't make some foolish you know, choices. If, but it, if, it was, if it was a 13-year-old, yeah, yeah. that would be a different thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So thank you again. Well, coming up, the man who's helped millions of Americans get their best sleep ever, My Pillow's Mike Lindell shares how he went from junkie to top CEO. He's here with us next when we come back. Doors began opening for entrepreneur Mike Lindell. He was having prophetic dreams, but knew if he was going to achieve success, he had to deal first with his addiction. Take a look. Mike Lindell, founder and CEO of MyPillow, has sold over 30 million pillows. Yet during the early days of the company, Mike was hiding a horrible secret. He was a crack cocaine addict. In 2009, Mike prayed to God for help and surrendered his life to Christ. His desire to use drugs was taken away. Today, he uses his platform to help others find freedom from addiction and freedom in Christ. With me now is CEO Mike Lindell. Great for, to have you here, Mike. It's an honor to be here. <laughs> From the time you were a young kid, well, first of all, you had some things happen in your family that kind of made the road a little rocky for you, but you've always been very entrepreneurial. Yeah, I've had every, I used to work at a drive-in movie theater in a grocery store, and these things that went at the grocery store, I'd always get into it with the, uh, with the owner, and finally he, finally he fired me, and he said, you know what, Mike? <laughs> um, he said, if you don't like these things, get your own company. Some days, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I have a lot of the stuff I didn't like back then. And with my own company, I put them in place. But, but after that, I became an entrepreneur. I, I became a, my sister flooded a third-story building of a of an apartment with a waterbed, and I became a carpet cleaner. Wow! And I was in treatment once, and in the middle of the night, I'm for I was in to get my license back. In the middle of the night, I asked this guy what he was do, used to do, and he says I used to have these lunch wagons. We'd open the sides in California and serve food on them to the businesses, and we didn't have that. Minneapolis on that site, so I called my friend up, pick me up in treatment. We got we're gonna we're gonna have lunch wagons and make. A, and Where did that come from? I mean, what were your either of your folks like that or a yeah, grandparent? You know, I don't know. Maybe I just li I like to you know, I like to lead. I think that's part of it. I just I, I'll see something that's you know that needs to be fixed, and I want to fix it. And uh, you can't do that. Yeah. You can't really do that if you work. I don't like. I don't like the corporate structures in America. I don't like that. We might like with my pillow. We always work off deviations and blocks. If I, I'll sit here at peace here, and if I don't hear from any, 500 of my employees have my direct number. Wow. But if I don't hear from them, I know everything is beautiful, you know. And but if there's a deviation, 
um, then I need to hear about it. I'll make it, you know, quick, you know, he'll do this, do this, and we adjust it. So wow. in corporate world, you all go, well, in third quarter, um, the projections are this. I mean, I don't, I can't stand PowerPoints. I don't even know what they all mean. You know, <laughs> I pray to God and say, where are we going to be, God? <laughs> and, uh, where, were you, where are you That's taking us? very refreshing, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> we had, in fact, we had a, I had a prophetic dream in, uh, in 2014 of where we were going to be financially. We were, we were within two days of going under at my pillow. And I had this dream, and and uh, we basically had to build another factory, it went, like build Noah's Ark, and wait for the rains to come on faith. And we went all in on faith, and um, and sure enough, it did happen. A factory, um, we 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 built this other part of the factory, and it just exploded in November of that year. I made a commercial with just myself, um, you know, showing you like the old days. We do all our own productions and our own our own commercials, the ideas, and it's a lot of fun. You have you mentioned prophetic dreams. That's been a part of your life yeah. for a long time. Yeah. God speaks yeah. to you that way. Tell yeah. me about what that's like for you. Yeah, it. You know, I didn't. For me. It's like, like when we were writing my book, I'm going, my, one of the guys helped me, said, Mike, I said, I don't know what to leave in, what to leave out. He said, the normal person, you know, something happened in 1987 or whatever, he pulls it out. The normal person would have surrendered that day on the spot. And, but I would get these prophetic dreams and, and visions that, that would always come to fruition. And, and it would be, um, uh, like I would talk to my friends and stuff and, and tell them things and then that would happen. So they'd find Jesus going, well, this is, you know, I'd look at it like mathematical odds. Like if you have a one in a million, a one in a billion or something that never happens uh, and you add them together, when does it become a miracle in your own life? You know, but the, as far as those visions, I seen once because I could never talk to people. I couldn't talk to people. There's no way. When I did the first commercial, the first infomercial, uh -huh. The night before we were doing our reads, and you know, I, I wasn't on drugs, and I was two years off of drugs, and and they, this real producer came in, and he goes, he's texting the other guy, he said, this is the worst guy I've ever seen in history. He will never make it on TV. <laughs> and the next day, I'm walking in the set, and I'm looking at the audience, and I'm scared to death, and I'm and I'm, we're doing our reads. It took one hour to do one line, and I said, you need to take that away. I just want to tell it naturally, like I did at shows and all those years. And that's how it comes off. And that's you know, and so that's why I, that's the way I do stuff. Just make it real. Back up, if you will, um, with me to the addiction issue, because a lot of people don't know that you struggled for 26 years yeah. with addiction. Yeah, you know, the, um, cocaine, I, you know, I, addictions come, I believe, from childhood and trauma and fatherlessness. I, mean, I was, you know, my family divorced when I was seven. I got into a new school and I would either, you know, show off yeah. or I wouldn't talk to strangers. You can't get rejected. I think a lot of people come from a self-worth button yes. where you don't can't get rejected. If you don't talk to people, you don't get rejected. I lived in Las Vegas once for 45 days and never talked to a soul. I used I was a professional card counter back then and yeah. and uh, but <laughs> but the cocaine when I got into cocaine it gave me a false sense of uh, a false bravery, you know, I courage. Can this false stuff. courage. Mm -hmm. I could talk to people. I was a very functioning cocaine addict for years, 20 years. Um, I got married, had four four kids and we were and uh, we were the you know, addiction affects everybody, not just uh, some you know, homeless lonely person. Yeah. It affects everybody no matter how many forks we eat with, I always say. Yeah. And, and you were actually in the in business doing business. Yeah, yeah. When I invented my pillow, I was a full blown crack addict. But I I put everything I had into this pillow because it, one thing it was giving me self worth. Uh -huh. I didn't need the drugs at the time, so it was like two parallel tracks. And then when it, you know maybe I'd have setbacks or whatever because I was turned down everywhere, I'd head back to the crack. But crack did take me down, and um, the pillow was just upholstering the during the you know just hanging on by a thread until Jan. Uh, uh, January 16th, 2009, where I did a, I told God it was, they say, was that your bottom, Mike? I said, well, that was my calling was going to be gone. I knew my pillow was just a platform for a much bigger thing. And you know, it wasn't just to help people so that way. When did Jesus grab a hold of this life well, you were in? This is interesting. Was, uh, the, uh, when, on that night, January 16, 2009, I did a full, I did a, a I, or I prayed to God and said, I want to be freed of the desire for the drugs. Amen. And then I will do the, this platform. Well, uh, I, I woke up the next day and something was different. The desire was gone. But two really? months later, two months later, I went to a faith-based treatment center 
where to find out why it was an attic in the first place and seeds were planted. But it wasn't until, now get this, you know, you always see me wearing my cross on TV and I was, that God was chasing me and I wanted to be that person. But it wasn't until February 18, 2017, just a few years ago, wow. where I went to, a, it's called Operation Restored Warrior. And I went to this for veterans actually, but the divine appointment, I got into that. And I went in there with hope. I had heard things that Jesus shows yeah. up and you do this full surrender. I went in there with hope and I did a full surrender, got these yeah. wounds, these deep down wounds addressed and Jesus filled them. And I um, walked out of there to now, not even a couple months later, I went out to U.S. Bank Stadium and prayed for 60 or 50,000 millennials, led them in prayer and I'm going so I could speak out for Jesus like I did a pillow. And it was it, in two months out or two weeks after that, and I didn't realize how my story of hope would, you know, God was Resonate, using me, yeah. resonates. Well, uh, two weeks after that, my granddaughter and I, well, she's like eight years old, we were at our amusement park in Minnesota. And all these millennials kept coming up to wow. me and going, your story, your, and I was only five minutes, my story, they go, and there was all these Christian bands, all these other things going on. They go, here's what meant something. They go, um, I, I found Jesus, I surrendered, I, you know, and they're telling me all these things that it was God showing me that hey, this is the story, this hope was working. And finally my granddaughter said, um, He's my grandpa. We need to go on rides. <laughs> <laughs> Smart girl. Smart. What would you say to somebody who suffers with an addiction like? I would say, number one, I, I, and, and if even if you're a family of an addict, I, addiction is a lot of work. It's such hard work. You know, when addicts get set free, they're the most amazing people. I believe addiction is not a disease. It comes from wounds, trauma. It's not, it's in deep down wounds. And those wounds, you need to be filled. And you need Jesus. And yeah, yeah. if you're out there, Everybody has story. You know, people see me the hope. You know, I'm 58 year old ex crack addict. Well, with my Linda Recovery Network, which I'm going to have, I'm going to take the let's say a 22 year old opiate addict. You're going to put in your age and your addiction and all these other commonality that you're going to see of 22 year old uh, heroin wow. addicts or whatever. You'll see them all, and they've been set free. And then you're going to find that you're going to go, wow, how did they get set free? Well, I'm going to have a code where you can get that. And you know, you're going to have to go to a church. I vetted, you know, two, like 2,000 churches. They'll get the code there and they'll open up and, they, and they'll have the help there. And, but right now, if you're out there, I can tell you the best help in the world is the faith-based treatment centers. Mm -hmm. These are your teen challenges, your salvation armies, your union gospels. They worked. In traditional secular treatment centers, they say, you oh, know, you did a lot of drugs and you hurt your family and you hurt your friends. You and already know that. And you feel, you feel bad when you get out there. Now you don't have your drugs. And, and I just, if you're out there, I just pray that you can, uh, you know, get, you know, address, you know, pray to Jesus to set you free of those and, and address those wounds. Because one of his names is Healer. Yes. And so if you want to know more of Mike's story, which is pretty incredible, his book, What Are the Odds, comes out this December, but you can pre-order a copy today. Just go to MikeLindellsBook.com. Mike, thanks so much for sharing with us today. It's an amazing story, and well, we rejoice with you. Yeah, that's God great. bless you all. There's hope. We're going to get rid of this addiction in our, in our country. Amen. Yep. Gordon? Still to come, a side of one Major League Baseball pitcher that you won't see on the mound. Ending slavery, child sex slavery, is, is somewhat daunting, but uh, it's able, and that's just what we're doing. We're just answering the call. See how he and his wife are fighting sex trafficking in Uganda. That's next, after this. Stay with us. Matt Boyd is one of the best pitchers in baseball. When not on the mound with the Detroit Tigers, Matt and his wife are fighting child slavery in Uganda. One particular platform in Detroit has become far-reaching, where Matt Boyd offers more conviction than just pitch. The Detroit Tigers left-handed starter provides at-risk kids with a safe home from trafficking and slavery in Uganda growing as guardian at his game and with the lives he helps protect. Matt, as a major league starting pitcher, what do you protect and defend when you take that mound? As a starting pitcher, we, uh, we can't score. So we're out there on the mound. We're keeping the game as it is. So you're defending the score. You've been described as game moment focused. Kind of fitting that there's a fight in this tiger. Where does that fight come from? 
you got to attack one pitch at a time. You got to live in the moment. His grace is perfected right now, not 10 minutes from now, not living in the past, and you could possibly miss out on what he has for you in that. So you got to be present in the moment. Commitment, endurance, perseverance, it's all a part of getting out of an inning. But getting out of the plight to end slavery, where do you draw strength from? Ending slavery, child sex slavery is, is somewhat daunting, but uh, it's able. You get, you get your strength from the Lord. You know that through Him, it's possible. You gotta be present where your feet are. That's where His grace is perfected, and only through that are we able to go end this thing. It's not on our own power. It's only through Him. We are happy to see you today. Matt and his wife Ashley are present with their feet and hearts a half world away, opposing child slavery through prevention at Kingdom Home, a refuge of restoration. Child sex slavery is a major issue in Uganda specifically. A lot of times when those children are rescued out of situations, they unfortunately don't have a place to go. Many of them were rescued from female genital mutilation or abandonment or forced child marriages, all these things that put them at risk. That's where we come in. We take those girls in and give them a place where they're safe, where they can grow up no longer at risk. Take us to Kingdom Home. What does it provide? All the girls' physical, educational, spiritual needs. We will provide them with beds, three healthy meals a day, things that they maybe have never had before, the clean clothes, running water. A new pair of shoes might seem little to us, to the biggest thing, which is love. We provide them with a loving family. They're all sisters now, and they have the house mother and the aunties who help her. You can't measure how important it is for a child to receive that sort of love, to be able to grow and thrive in a healthy way. On your first trip to Uganda, what did you see in those girls' eyes? Joy, happiness, singing, dancing, playing baseball, going to school, just enjoying every single moment. Nothing of the past was present, but they were part of a family. We just saw children living as they should. So how do you narrow the distance between a life in Detroit and desperate lives in Uganda? It's quite a distance, but when you have a call, when your heart is pulled, when God is truly leading you to something, that's the choice that has to be made, is to, is to step forward in faith and go, what's next? And that's just what we're doing. We're just answering the call. Matt, to end the cycle of abuse, what's the game changer? Awareness. Bring light to the darkness. Expose this thing. It's not fun to talk about. People don't like talking about this issue. But the sex trade is real. Child sex slavery is real. Awareness is huge. You're giving them an opportunity to transform their lives. The city that you play in here, Detroit, even in its resilience, there's still scars from abandonment. Describe for me the power of hope and restoration. Uh, as you ask that question, I just have this image of God breaking chains. When we take this field wearing that D on our chest, we go out there, we're representing more than just the name on the back. It's, it's what's on the front, it's this city, it's everyone else. And we're breaking those chains of the negativity that, you know, that may be here. Chains are being broken over there too. How has your involvement in these girls' lives changed yours? It really changes your perspective on what's important in life. I mean, things that used to be a big deal aren't as big of a deal because yeah. you realize that what you're facing is nothing compared to what those kids are facing. How have you seen unconditional love in kids that have been abused? Yeah. Their house mother, Dorothy, is the symbol of it. She shares the love of Christ with all of them, and it is truly amazing. She is a hero in my life. She's a hero in my wife's life. We're just so happy to partner with her. She was rescued out of this as a child at eight years old. That's where you see God's love that is limitless, and it's just a true image of how God loves. How does salvation and deliverance look different to you now? Well, now I have a very real picture of it. We know these girls' stories. We've seen that transformation work in them that's all just through the love of Christ, that they're receiving, God's restoring them. That's salvation. But their story's not over yet. God has great plans for them. 
and I can't wait for the day when I get to go back there and go to their graduation and go to their weddings and to see God's victory over their lives. What's done is done. The past, it's gone. They have a family and their family and identity is in Christ now. And through Him, they can do anything. That's the key. Through Him, we can do anything. So here's Matt, he's definitely got a full-time job, uh, and it's a very demanding thing that he's doing. But he's saying, what can I do? How can I make a difference? And of all places, he says, I I'm going to do it in Uganda. And he and his wife start something, and they just take that first step. When you look at sex trafficking in the world today, and whether that's Africa or Asia or right here in the United States, it's so easy to say, this problem is just too big for me. Uh, I, I can't handle this. But Matt said, no, it's not too big for God. And with him, I can do all things. And so I, I, I may not be able to save all the children, but I can save this one. And, and if I can save this one, then can I save another? And, and how can I save yet another? And how do I get a group thing going? And how can I make a difference for them? Because if I do it for one, uh, there's wonderful things that happen generationally because I just saved one. One. Get the infinity of what can happen when you just start. And it's that first step to say, uh, I can't do it, but God can. If He's going to lead me and direct me, I'm going to do it. You can get out of your comfort zone and get into a great God adventure. Here's a word from Psalm 86 But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. God bless you. We'll see you again.